you for that. This is Fenner, and I'm so thankful for uh, the truths in that song. Uh, of course, uh, uh, he is a friend, and we're going to preach a little bit about that this morning. And so if you take your Bibles and go to the book of Colossians, as uh, we've uh, already mentioned, and when we're in chapter 2, verse number 8, if you're able and willing to join me in standing, I'd ask you to do that in honor of the reading of God's Word. And we'll, as I mentioned, Colossians chapter 2, we'll read verse number 8 and down through verse number 15. <clears throat> Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments and of the, of the world, and not after Christ. Uh, we see in this passage rudiments uh, in the book of Colossians, rudiments of the world twice. That, that phrase rudiments is only found, uh, uh, the, the word rudiments is only found twice in all of Scripture, and it's both paired with the word world, rudiments of the world. The word rudiments means a order or uh, a rules. Uh, the, the order or rules of the world, and not after Christ. Let me start over. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him, that's after Christ, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. In whom also ye are circum, uh, you are uh, circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh of the circumcision of Christ, or by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. There again, we see the, the idea of ordinance or rudiments. The ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing, uh, triumphing over them in it. And so this morning, we start with, Beware lest any man spoil you. And we finish uh, with verse number 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. And so... The title of the message this morning is Spoiling the Spoiler, or the Spoiler Spoiled. The Spoiler Spoiler Spoiled. Uh, I almost titled it, and maybe you can subtitle if you want to add this title. You can write whatever title you want if you're taking notes. Uh, the Greatest Show on Earth. The Greatest Show on Earth. And as we look at Jesus Christ, and, and we really we preach about uh, laying all our anxieties, all our cares, all our burdens at the feet of Jesus Christ, because he's, he's, he's taking victory over all of them. He's triumphed over every one of them, and, and uh, so I'm excited about the message and, uh, and looking forward to, to preaching it and preaching and preaching and preaching, and we'll finish eventually this morning. I'm, we'll finish, uh, but I'm looking forward to uh, the message this morning. It's good to have Brother DJ uh, with us. I failed to mention him when visitors. He's not a visitor, uh, but he's home for, uh, from spring break from college. And so, Brother, Brother DJ, would you uh, uh, pray uh, for the Lord's blessing on the message, please? Amen. Thank you, Brother DJ. You may be seated. The passage we read is only a portion of a larger section of Scripture that informs us that although we are sinners, that we have no right to the blessings of Jesus Christ, uh, 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 that though, although we have no right to the blessing of Jesus Christ, through the unmerited, gracious sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we are given bountiful treasures, treasures that cannot be obtained by anyone or given by another, uh, in other words, spiritual freedom, 
that cause the jealousy of worldly religion and create an offense against us to steal those treasures by tricking us into believing that we must live by a set of rules to attain them. Now that's a long uh, explanation of this passage. Let me say it again. The passage you read is only a portion of the larger uh, section of Scripture that informs us that although we are sinners and have no right to the blessings of Jesus Christ, through the unmerited gracious sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we are given bountiful treasures. We don't deserve them. We're sinners. We don't deserve them, but we are given bountiful treasures. Treasures that cannot be obtained by anyone or given by another. Treasures that, uh, 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 we're not talking about gold, we're not talking about silver, we're not talking about land and and houses and and vehicles, Uh, we're talking about treasures that cannot be obtained by anyone physically, nor given by anyone else. We're talking about a spiritual freedom. We're talking about a a heart's freedom. We're talking about the ability, as the song was sung, to lay our burdens at the foot of Jesus Christ, something that no man can give us, that's not in the ability of any man to give. We're talking about bountiful treasures that cause the jealousy of worldly religion. They look on those freedoms, that spiritual freedom, and worldly religion looks on those with jealousy and, and that create those treasures create an offense by those, that worldly religion, by those principalities, by those powers uh, uh, to steal the treasures that we have by tricking believers into believing that we must live or the lost that trick them into believing that to have, to attain those treasures We must live by a set of rules. That's what this passage is. In fact, if you grasped the wholeness of that paragraph right there, that's the message. Right there, you can go home. We can be done. Let me try to uh, let me try to, to break it down a little further. And let me just get right into the outline. Number one, we see the warning. Verse number eight gives us the warning. Beware. Uh, um, we're, we're, this is a passage that, that could be uh, written to believers. It could be written to unbelievers. But to beware, what he's trying, to, uh, uh, the Spirit of God is trying to get us to, to know and, and be aware of is, hey, there are religion, there is religion out there, there is a, a devil out there, there's a world out there that's trying to steal the blessings that you have. Beware lest any man spoil you. Now that word spoil doesn't mean uh, uh, like a fruit or a vegetable spoils, although it kind of has that, that, that if we, if we uh, think about how uh, we have a perfect um, a fruit, we have a perfect vegetable, if, you have a, uh, if we have a tomato in, in front of you. In fact, uh, here in a few months, uh, hopefully, I, I, the weather's kind of, uh, I think February and March got together. You know, remember when you were in school and you came to, to school and you, you, you brought your lunch and you didn't buy lunch, or you brought lunch, and you saw someone else's lunch, and you liked what they had better than what you had, and so you said, hey, let's trade. I think February and March got together. And you remember what February was like in the 70s and just beautiful days? I think February uh, got together with March and they said, hey, let's switch. Uh, we'll get the warm weather in February, and they're like, it's, trick people thinking and it's, it's spring, and then March said, yeah, I want to be 20 degrees in the, you know, the two days before spring starts. And so anyway, I think they got together and switched. But anyway, I don't, that was beside the point. Um, <laughs> uh, a few months, we'll, we'll have, uh, we'll have uh, June, July, uh, people have gardens, and they'll have those beautiful homegrown, no, not the, not, the, not the grocery store kind of tomatoes where you cut them and there's, you know, they're kind of white and lethargic looking. I'm talking about those tomatoes where you cut and they're just that beautiful red and they're juicy. If we had a big tomato, just a beautiful homegrown uh, uh, beef steak tomato right up here and, and we just let it sit for a month and it spoils. What happens is the treasure that's there it is taken away. The idea of spoiling is what you had, once had, is taken away. When I think of the word spoil, honestly, what I think of every time is I think of David and his mighty men coming back to Ziklag. That's the, that's, if you say the word spoil, that's what I think of. I think David, he's, he was going to fight with the Philistines and, and with his mighty men, and he came back to Ziklag, and he comes back to Ziklag, and uh, as they, they, they 
uh, in my mind, as they cross over the hilltop and they can see uh, uh, in the distance, they see smoke rising from where they think the city is. You ever been driving and you see smoke uh, you know, on one of the hilltops or, and you say, where's that, where that coming from? That must be somewhere and you're trying to estimate about where it is. And I think of David and his men coming over the hilltop on that. That looks like that's pretty close to Ziklag. That looks like it might be a home. And, and so they started anticipating what they might find and they got to Ziklag and, and they found that their city uh, was burning. But not only that, but everything had been spoiled. The... Amalekites had come in, and they'd taken all their wives, all their children, all their animals. There was nothing left. They, they had taken everything they had. In this passage, it, that's what this is saying. That's exactly what it's talking about. Beware lest any man spoil or take away what you have. Through philosophy, they're saying that, that, that there's a philosophy can, can take away and, and, and with vain deceit can take away after the tradition of men, after the tra- rudiments of the world and not after Christ. There are those that will, and we'll get to this in a moment, we'll get to the enemy in a moment, but there are those that, that are going to try to take away what God's given you through the tradition of men, through the rudiments of this world. In verse number four, uh, uh, chapter two, verse number four, it says, In this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. In this passage, there's a number uh, of warnings. Say, hey, they're going to try to steal something from you. They're trying to deceive you and take something from you. In verse, number, uh, in verse number 18 of this passage, look what it says. Let no man beguile you of your reward. Again, a warning, a caution. Hey, don't, uh, don't let them take what God's given you through religion, through the rudiments, through the tradition of man. There's a warning. What are they taking? What do we have that is so coveted, that is so uh, desired? What do, they, what do we have when we think about David and his mighty men? And of course, the, the wives and the, the children and, and, uh, and all the, the, their stuff. That's a good Bible word. Their stuff and their animals. We understand that why you'd want to, what, what does a believer have? What does a, a person have or have the ability to have through Christ that, this, that worldly religion desi- desires to take? What are, they, what are they taking? What are they spoiling from us? Well, that leads me to number two. I said number one, the warning. Number two, the wealth. Now let's go back, and again, I'd like to preach this whole passage. We don't have time to read all of this passage. But let's look at verse number one. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you. Now here's the apostle Paul writing to the church at Colossae. And he's saying, hey, listen, I'm fighting for you. I wish you knew the struggle, the fight that I have for you. And for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. He said, I am struggling, I'm striving for you and those at Laodicea and others that haven't seen my face, that you can understand what treasures you have. And the, and the, the, the a full assurance of understanding, the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, of the Father and of Jesus Christ, in whom, in Jesus Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so as we look at verse number four, it speaks of the treasures that are hid in, first of all, the mystery of God. You say, Pastor, the mystery of God, what are we talking about, some kind of uh, who done it? Are we talking about a you know Miss Marple or the, the Hardy Boys? What are you talking about? What are you talking about a mystery, the mystery of God? Well, let's look back in chapter one. The Bible describes, defines, explains the Bible in chapter one, verse number. Let's start in verse number twenty-five. Um, he's talking about the, the 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 church, which is the body of Jesus Christ. There, the, uh, the Jesus Christ, the head of the body. Verse 25, whereof, so he's of Jesus Christ in the church, he is made a minister. So he's saying, I'm a minister. Whereof I'm, I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to you for you, or given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. He said, I'm a minister. Now, the word dispensation means a pouring out, and a minister is one who 
does the pouring out, ministers, who, who gives out. He says, I'm trying to serve you something. I'm trying to give you something here. And he says, to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery, now here's the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations. And let me say this, the mystery is no mystery to you and I. It's no mystery to you and I. Uh, um, it, it's as if uh, you're watching a, 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 hit, a whodunit, reading a mystery novel, and you've already read it. You already know the end of it. We already know. We know the mystery. All right? So it says, uh, um, to, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest. It's made clear. We can see it to his saints. Are you a saint? Amen. You say, well, wait a minute. I'm not a saint. I'm Saint David. No, I'm, I am a saint. If you're in Christ, you're a saint. Uh, I, uh, uh, you see Saint Matthew and Saint Mark and Saint Luke, and you say, well, that's uh, from the Catholic influence, and I get that, but they weren't ever, they're not divine. Matthew's not divine. Mark's not divine. Luke, John, uh, but they're still saints, right? We're all saints. We're in Christ. We're saints, right? And so it made manifest. So if you're a saint, then this mystery is made clear, uh, made manifest. It, you can see it. To whom, to us, the saints, God hath, uh, would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. All right, what is it? Drum roll. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What he's saying is the mystery is, uh, as the, and we, we talked about this uh, a couple Wednesday nights ago, that, that, Jesus, that the prophets looked into and the prophets prophesied of the coming of Jesus Christ. And, and as Jesus Christ is, is now come and is here, he's the Messiah. He was sacrificed. There was a mystery. They weren't sure. That they, they, they didn't, it wasn't clear. They knew something was coming. But then Jesus Christ appeared and it's God in the flesh. In the next chapter, we read that in him, we just started, read it a few minutes ago, in him, Jesus Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And, and over here, they were looking, they had, uh, as we, we would read, shadow of things to come. In verse, we haven't read it, I think it's verse number 19 or 20. It, it's a, a shadow of things to come in the, in the law and in the, uh, uh, the, the tabernacle and then in the temple. It's a shadow of things to come. And, and they were looking, but they couldn't see it clearly because he wasn't here yet and then jesus christ came and the mystery is made manifest god in in the flesh jesus christ and now he's in if you've accepted if you're a saint he's in you and we have the hope of glory whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. He said, I'm serving, I'm a minister, and I'm working to present this mystery, to present Jesus Christ to all men everywhere. Even as it says in, the, in verse number uh, uh, 27, even to the Gentiles. Uh, the, they didn't have the image. They didn't have the, the, uh, the shadow of things to come. But the, the Jews had the shadow of things to come. But even though the, the Gentiles didn't have the shadow of things to come, they didn't have the law, they didn't have the tabernacle, they didn't have the temple, Jesus Christ is still revealed to them. And I'm so thankful because I'm a Gentile. And yet I can accept Christ as my Savior. A, a Jewish Messiah. He is my Savior. He's made manifest. He's made clear to me. So what are these, what's this wealth, this mystery of God that's uh, Christ in you? Uh, we also see the treasures of, of God and, and uh, of God the Father and of, of Jesus Christ there in verse number four of chapter one. What kind of treasures uh, 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 do we have that are in Christ Jesus? Or what kind of treasures are we that are in possession of Christ Jesus in possession of? Well, what kind of treasures? Well, chapter 1 begins telling us about the treasures. In verse number 9, it says, For this cause, now, in verses 1 through uh, 1 and 2, uh, where he's giving a greeting in, in, in Jesus Christ's name. 
And in verses 3 through 8, he's, he's grateful for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it starts, and again, I wanted to preach this whole passage. We won't have time to do it. So, but he's grateful for, for the gospel of Jesus Christ and what, uh, what, we're get, uh, what, uh, what he's done. And then in verse number 9, uh, verses 3 through 8 kind of tell us what he's done. But then in verse 9, it begins to tell us what we have. The glorying in the gifts of Jesus Christ. It says, for this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, the, the gospel, do not cease to, I'm sorry, that's uh, uh, that they believed in the gospel. Do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. And there's, we start right off the bat. There's one of the things that are the treasures of having Jesus Christ. That we have the knowledge of his will. I'm thankful, in fact, not just his will, but in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You turn on the news, turn on uh, social media, you look around what's going on. Uh, Brother uh, Hewitt and I were talking about the geopolitical uh, uh, news that's going on. And and sometimes you look and you say, how can people not see? How can people not understand? How, How does this possible? I was telling a couple of people, guys after church the other day uh, that not last week, but the week before was International Women's Day. And I'm not opposed to international. I think, there's, I think there's more holidays than we actually need, but uh, I'm, you know, the, celebrating womanhood, that's a good thing. In, in the, the White House, uh, Mrs. Biden and someone, uh, someone in the, the government, I don't know who it was, but they were recognizing several women on International Women's Day that had done something exceptional. One of the ones who they were recognizing and gave an award to was a transgender person. So now stop and think about this. International Women's Day, they're celebrating a man who says he's a woman. Now look, look, does people, I mean, uh, I don't even have words to, <laughs> I mean, as I say that, everybody just shakes their head. I don't even have words to describe the foolishness. Uh, how do you, it's International Women's Day. It's something that's made up by the world anyway. Uh, okay, that's fine. But we're going to celebrate a man who says he's, do you understand that there's no spiritual understanding in this world? And you look and you say, what, how do people not see this? How do people not understand? How do people not get what's going on? How can people uh, uh, continue to go down this road? Because in Christ, there's knowledge of his will. Listen, that kind of foolishness is against God's will. Uh, the knowledge of his will, the knowledge of his wisdom. That is something that, that you have in Christ Jesus that is not accessible to the world. The, spiritual understanding. Hey, you and I look at things like that and, and there's a, a whole host of things we could look at in the news and we say, how, how, how is that possible? How could anyone do that? Because in Christ Jesus, there is a, a spiritual understanding. There is a spiritual will. Uh, we see the, the will of God that, that we only have in Christ Jesus. What the world needs is Jesus Christ. We need to preach Jesus Christ to them. That we need to be ministers like the Apostle Paul of Jesus Christ, the gospel of of God, the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ, so that they might have spiritual understanding. What else do we have? That's verse number nine. And we won't look at every verse here, but look at verse number, oh, we could talk about verse 12, how that we're meet, uh, made to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Uh, We'll look at verse 14. In whom, in Jesus Christ, we have redemption. Praise the Lord that we have redemption. That's one of the treasures that we have. In fact, look at verse number 21, down to verse number 21. And you, that were sometime alienated. Now, we're going to talk about reconciliation in a moment. But that thought that we were that we were away from God. And now we're redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ. He's bought us back. What a wonderful treasure. I'm owned and double owned by the Lord Jesus Christ. I was, I was made and created by God and then purchased by Jesus Christ, by God through Jesus Christ. 
I have redemption. That's a wonderful treasure. That's, that's a blessing that you do not have outside of Jesus Christ. How about this one? Verse number 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Oh, even the forgiveness of sins. You're late at, in bed at night. And the flesh and the devil, the accuser of the brethren began to say, hey, do you remember who you were? Do you remember what you've done? Do you remember that one day? Do you remember that one night? Hey, do you remember way back? Do you, do you remember? And what a wonderful treasure we have in the forgiveness of sins. cast as far as the east is from the west. He doesn't remember them. He forgives our sin. Can I tell you that cannot be purchased by anyone? Brother Marshall, uh, if I, uh, this last week we were talking about um, March Madness, and if you filled out the bracket perfectly, you get a billion dollars. And so Mrs. Martin was hoping that I would get a, win a billion dollars so I could give her a million. Not going to happen. But let's say I gave you a million dollars and all the things, or a billion dollars, and all the things you could purchase. And, and sometimes uh, uh, we let our minds go there. I, I, you think, well, I, what would I do if I had a billion dollars? What would I do if I had a million dollars? I'd buy a car and buy a house and pay off my house. I'd pay off my family's. Uh, uh, you know, I'd, I'd pay everybody. I'd give this person a million dollars and this person a million dollars. And, and I told Mrs. Martin she was only getting 10000 not a million. But anyway, I'd give, I'd give this and give that and give that. But you know what you can't buy? You can't buy forgiveness of sins. You can't, you can't buy a peace in your heart that, comes, that, that, that only comes from knowing that I'm trusted in Jesus Christ and he's wiped away every sin. Praise the Lord, it's a treasure that you can't, no one can give you. It can't come from anyone else but only Jesus Christ. Redemption. Forgiveness of sins. Verse 21, and you that were sometimes alienated, a foreigner, that's what the word alien means, a foreign. You were a foreigner and an enemy in your mind by wicked works. Who you talk, who's it talking about? A, a, an alien to the, the government of the United States? No, an alien to God. Alienated and enemies in your mind. You're not just an alien, but an enemy of God in your mind by wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled. <laughs> in the body of his flesh through death to present you, oh, you were, you were wicked and you were filthy, and yet through the blood of Jesus Christ, you've been reconciled. Now, God's got you right there under his arm. There, there's nothing between, look what it says, holy, unblameable, unreprovable. <laughs> what a treasure! That in the presence of God, I'm holy. Now look, look, I know who I am. I'm wicked. I'm filthy. Yet through the blood of Jesus Christ, look what it says. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. Talking about the death uh, on the cross. It's referring to, to the, the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Through uh, 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 in the body of his flesh through death to present you through the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. In fact, uh, in, in, let's go ahead and look over here real quick. In, in, I don't I want to get ahead of myself, but in verse 13 of chapter 2, it says, and you, being dead in your sins, no, I'm sorry, back to verse number, where are we looking? Verse 11, in whom it's speaking of Jesus Christ, also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. You mean there can be a circumcision without hands? In putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. It, meaning Jesus Christ takes the flesh, takes the sin, takes the payment of sin, and gets rid of it. Right? 
through the, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation. The operation means movement or action. Through the action, the, mo- the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Let's go back to chapter 1, verse 20, uh, 21. Uh, verse 22, in the body of his flesh, through death, the, the sacrifice of his, of, of his death presented you holy. Now, do you, do you realize how wicked you are? Do you know how much of a sin, sinner you are? Most of us don't have to be reminded. Most of us, the accuser of the brethren, does a, a good job for us already. But can I tell you that through forgiveness of sins through the reconciliation of Jesus Christ, now we stand in the presence of God and we're holy. How is it possible that I can stand holy in front of God? My friend, there's nothing, there's no one that can give that to you. There's no amount of money that can buy that. Unblameable. You can't even be blamed. They can't, they can't even say, well, it's your fault or this is the reason. Unblameable. Un. Uh, uh, not unreproachable, uh, unreprovable. Reprove means, hey, let's get that right. There's nothing even to fix in me. There's nothing even to correct me for. You say, you're perfect. No, I'm not saying that I'm perfect in, in my actions, but in the, the eyes of God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm unreprovable. I'm, I'm clean. I'm perfect. I'm holy. Now it knows, now you know why it says that we should come boldly before the throne. Oh, because so often you say, well, I don't, I, I, sin, sin keeps us from the presence of God. I think it was, uh, I've heard my dad say, I think he would quote uh, a brother Keene, Charles Keene, that would say uh, that many times we don't, we don't desire to be in the presence of God because we're uncomfortable in his presence. We don't go to God in prayer because we're uncomfortable in his presence because we know we're sinners But can I tell you, through the blood of Jesus Christ, one of the treasures we have is we're unreprovable in the eyes of God. In the presence of God, we're reconciled to Him. Hey, hey, don't avoid prayer. Don't avoid the presence of God because you're a sinner. No, because through the blood of Jesus Christ, you have a treasure that you're unreprovable. You're holy. Now, I'm not saying that I'm perfect, and I'll get to that in a moment. That I'm, no, I, I still have a sin nature here. But in the presence of God, in the eyes of God through the blood of Jesus Christ, I have a treasure that cannot be given to me by anyone else. That no one could purchase, no one could give. What else do we have? The wealth. I talked about the the knowledge of his will and wisdom, spiritual understanding, redemption, forgiveness of sins, reconciliation, holy, unblameable, unreprovable. How about this one? Look at chapter 1, verse number 28. The end of chapter 28, or the end of chapter 1. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Look at chapter 2 and verse number uh, 10. And ye are complete. Those are sister words. Perfect and complete. Meaning needs nothing else. The idea of complete means if I had had a glass right here, and I begin to fill it up with water, and you say, well, it's a, a quarter of the way full, it's a third of the way full, it's halfway full, it's a, a two-thirds full, it's three-quarters full, it's seven-eighths full, it's eight-ninths full, it's nine-tenths full, it's, it's full. It's complete, can't get any more. In fact, the idea in the Greek there is that it's actually more than you need. It's, you, know, you know where that glass where you, there's something about water tension and Ask Brother Abraham, he'll explain it to you later. He's a scientist. But it actually looks up, it goes above the, the glass because the, 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 the water tension. And then you just drop one more drop and it breaks that tension and goes, that's what the idea of complete is. It, there's, it's, it's full. You cannot get any more. You are everything you need to be in Jesus Christ. Complete. Do, do I need to describe to you, do, do I need to keep on going to describe the, how great the wealth is? The treasures are that we have in Jesus Christ? These treasures are only, now listen, these treasures are only given to us through the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's it. There is no other way to have those 
those treasures. When, when we talk about the, the, re, the reconciliation, the redemption, the forgiveness of sins, oh, how wonderful it is, and you think, well, I, I could have that some other way. Nope, sorry. The only way that you can have those treasures is through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's it. That's the only way. And, and that's what these passages are talking about. In fact, we go back to chapter 1. It's magnifying the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ because we have these wonderful treasures. But then we come back to this warning. Verse number 8. Beware. Now you have bountiful treasures stored away. But can I tell you that those treasures, at least according to this passage can be stolen from you. The word, the word spoil means to take by force. It, it, it's taken away. It, it, it's, it, it's extracted from you. You no longer have it. Say, so I can no longer have forgiveness. No, you still have forgiveness in the eyes of God. But what I'm saying is that there are things that we forget that we have. Or the lost man those that have never accepted Christ as their Savior, those things are taken from them, meaning they can't get them. Now notice what it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and after the, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. So those treasures that we have, they're in Christ but there are those that are following the traditions, the tradition of men. Look at verse 13. And being dead, and you being dead in your sins and, uncircumcised, uh, 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 and the uncircumcision of your flesh, uh, the uncircumcision, uh, uncircumcision of your flesh refers to the Gentiles. Hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. All right, now, quickly, take your Bibles back and look at uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 15. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 15. What are the ordinances that were against us? Having abolished in the flesh the enmity, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. The ordinances are the law. Hey, you have to do this. Uh, we could start with uh, uh, in the, the book of Exodus and we could talk about all the, the, the commandments Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Number one, and go through all the commandments. The Bible says, it is appointed a man once to die, and after this, the judgment. We'll stand in our judgment and the, the, the handwriting of ordinances. Uh, uh, the ordinances will come up and say, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And didn't do that one. We could go down the list. Especially in light of the Gospels, uh, when Jesus Christ came and said, you know, uh, it said not to murder, the law said not to murder, but if you looked on your brother to hate him, you've murdered. It says not to commit adultery, but if you looked at a, a woman uh, and, 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 uh, uh, with lust, then you've committed adultery in your heart. And we go every one of these, uh, in, in the light of what Jesus Christ said, we go every one of these, and, 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 guilty. Now that's what it says. Look what it says in, in verse number, go back to Colossians chapter 2. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, uh, uh, made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out. Now he's taking, he comes in during that, that judgment and he says, nope, I'm blotting out the, the, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. <laughs> and having spoiled principalities and powers. Now I wish we could take time to go through this. We see principalities and powers three times mentioned in, in uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2. It says that he was 
he's, he's uh, created them. It says in at verse number 10, he's the head of them. And now it says he's spoiling them. Those things that came and said, you know what? This uh, religion, the religion of the world teaches us that we must work to obtain favor in the eyes of God. The te- these, this, teaches, this teaching attempts to steal from you your knowledge of God, your redemption, your forgiveness, your perfection. And it goes on to say in verse number 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of the, respect of the holiday or of the new moon or the Sabbath, uh, which are the shadow of things to come, but uh, the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, uh, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up uh, by the fleshly mind and not holding the head. Um, uh, um, and it's talking about, hey, uh, uh, verse 21, or verse 20. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not. Which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. He said, now, look, you didn't get those. You didn't get the treasures of God by keeping the commandments. The commandments are against you. Now, let me caution you before you think, well, that means that there's never a commandment that we need to obey. That's not what this is teaching. This is teaching we don't have salvation. You say, oh, well, I'm not so sure about that. Well, let's look at chapter 3, verse number 1, and I'll get back to the chapter 2. If ye then be risen with Christ, if you're saved and he's given you a quickening, if you're risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above. Look at verse number five. Mortify, kill, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection. So he's, and we go down this list. In fact, it's in this chapter, it says, uh, wives, submit yourselves to your husband. Husbands, love your wives. And, and it adds, in this passage, it adds something that's not in Ephesians. It says, and be not bitter. Look what it says, Colossians chapter three, verse number 19. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Man, that's... That can be tough to do sometimes. I'm just saying that there are things we need to do, but it's not to earn the treasures of God. The treasures of God are in Christ Jesus. They are given to us through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And as a new man in Christ, I desire to please him. I desire to to put off the old man and not live after the flesh, but live after Christ. And so we look at, I said, the warning the wealth, the wily, the, the religion of the world that teaches us to obtain the blessings of God, you must do, do, do. We are cautioned about uh, uh, but that, that worldly religion teaches us that we must do to have life. The gospel of, te- of Jesus Christ teaches us that through the life of Jesus Christ, we can do. We have the treasures. We can go back to chapter one and say we have the, the strength that Jesus Christ gives us to do what we need to do. Finally, let me say this. The warning, the wealth, the wily, and finally, number four, the winner. (laughs) Who has the ability to win these treasures for us? Who has the ability to take the, the, the spoiler and spoil them? Now look what it says. Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and take it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing triumphing over them in it. Can I tell you that all the things that want to take the, the treasures from you, whether it's the, the, the principalities that we see or the powers that we don't see, all those that want to take away the treasures that you have in Christ Jesus, he has spoiled or will spoil them in the end. And in the cross, he spoiled them and he triumphed over them, making a show, <laughs> making a show of them. When you say making a show, it's literally talking about showing off or showing how great he is. When I think of making a show of them, I I can't help but think of the picture. Uh, uh, I think it's, um, uh, I forget who he was standing over, but 
but uh, the picture of Muhammad Ali as he's standing over at um, Sunny, I was going to say Mosey Lister, but I think that's somebody else altogether. I think that's a boxer. Anyway, she wrote songs. Anyway, Sonny, that's, I'm just, hey, I won and I'm the victor. Jesus Christ is the victor. He gave us all the victory. He gave us the, the power. He gave us that treasure, those treasures you have. They only come in Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful that as an 11-year-old boy, I accepted the 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 finished work of Jesus Christ. I've, I've accepted his work. I, I'm, I'm nothing in the presence of God, yet I'm made so much and holy, unblameable, unreprovable in the presence of God because of Jesus Christ. And that happened when I was 11 years old when I asked him to save me. Have you done that? Have you asked Jesus Christ to save you? Do you have treasures unspeakable you have treasures that are that are so uh, 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 that mount up so much that you can't even explain them that no man can give you that no man can take from you well when we start to live as if we have to live for them they're taken they were spoiled of them know how many people don't know Christ as their savior and they have the ability to have treasures beyond imagination if they would just accept Christ as their Savior. Can I tell you, Christian, you have treasures you have access to that we sometimes just don't eat, we ignore by living in the flesh, by living in the world. Take advantage of the treasures that you have the ability to live in. Father in heaven, help us, Lord, I pray to be ministers as the Apostle Paul was of this gospel, to tell the world that Jesus Christ gives treasures that no one else can give, that can't be purchased, that can't be won, that can only be given through Jesus Christ. Lord, if there's one here today that doesn't have forgiveness of sins, that doesn't have uh, has not been reconciled to you, has not been redeemed. Oh, God in heaven, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. I pray that they would accept Christ as their, sin, or as their Savior. They'd realize they're a sinner and accept Christ as the Savior. And trust Him today, I pray. And then those that know Christ as their Savior, that have these wonderful treasures, Lord, help us appreciate them. Uh, through chapter 1, we see so many times how the, the gratitude that's expressed because of what you've done for us. Help, help us be grateful for what you've done, and then help us express it to others and tell others. Help us to beware that it's not stolen from us, that we fall into uh, uh, the rudiments of the world, that we have to maintain a salvation or maintain uh, some kind of... Uh, 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 pleasure in your presence, Lord, that we come boldly before the throne daily and walk in, the, in the, the new life that Christ has given us. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that you bless this invitation with heads bowed and eyes.